Good evening and thank you for your information, invitation. A moje to predavanje će biti na makedonskom. My lecture will be in Macedonian language. It's much easier for me to speak in my native language and to describe things and concepts that sometimes we need to uh, to explain in philosophic terms. It is truly an honor to be invited here in the Oxford Union, especially having in mind the fact that one of your founders, Gladstone, was a great friend of the Republic of Macedonia. When many people were afraid to even mention the word Macedonia, he used to say that Macedonia should belong to the Macedonians, and we are very proud to have had such a great friend who established this type of institution where people are able to share and to express their thoughts, observations, and ideas. I will not speak about Macedonia and the Macedonian history, but what I want to talk about is the world that we will leave to you, the young people. Let me start by tomorrow. Tomorrow, on October 31st, we will mark a key event about on, uh, in uh, Western civilization. So tomorrow is the day when Martin Luther King, on that date, he, he uh, published his 95 Theses 500 years ago. Tomorrow the world will have many comments, many analysis, and many articles written uh, on Martin Luther and what he started, and he started the Reformation. He was the brave person who opposed the Catholic Church, and as a result of all of that, we will later have the Protestants, those who will later on shape and transform Western civilization. There will also be an intolerance between Protestants and Catholics, and 100 years after that fact, they will, there was actually a religious war between these two that lasted for 30 years. The war was finished with the Westphalian peace. The Westphalian peace is the basis of our international order as we know it. So this was the promotion of the idea of a sovereign state, of secularism, of everything that we know now as an advantage, a benefit, and a privilege from the Western civilizations. The winners of the Second World War on the basis of this uh, Westphalian peace and that world order will later on shape our international policy, uh, politics, sorry, and then they will gather all sovereign countries in the United Nations. The United Nations will play a key role during the time of the Cold War in the 20th century. And then with the collapse of communism, in 1989, that collapse was followed by a period where the entire power was shifted to the United States. You know Francis Fukuyama with great tri triumphalism, he announced the end of history. Fukuyama actually did not say anything new, he only quoted Hegel during his time in at the university so when hegel at that time saw napoleon uh, coming on a uh, entering on a white horse he was um, he was amazed by his personality but this triumphalism this sense of triumph lasted for a very short while if you take a look at the analysis of the international order you will see many observations. For example, Kissinger, when he promoted his new book, he simply said that the international order is in chaos. Zbigniew Brzezinski, before he died, he also published a very important book in which he said that the power from the West is slowly shifting to the East. Farid Zakaria said that we are living in a post-American world, America, whereby America did not lose its power. They remain the strongest economy in the world, one-fourth of world economy is U.S., but that other people uh, uh, that other countries uh, achieved the same level as the United States. And so his observation was that the multipolar world is ending. This is a time in which all of the privileges and benefits that uh, Martin Luther initiated and started are now brought into question. For example, Crouch talks about post-democracy. Mason talks about post-capitalism. Po 
The Canadian Prime Minister talks about a post-national country, that Canada will become the first country of that sort. The word, the key word, the word of the year last year was post-truth. So we are entering in a period where everything is post. What does this mean? This means that when you use post terms, this is an indication that major changes are about to happen or are already happening. Perhaps the best definition of that time of major transformations is given by a left-wing, um, uh, a leftist philosopher from Italy, Antonio Gramsci. During the fascist period in Italy, Antonio Gramsci was in prison and in his prison notes he said that when the old world has not died yet and the new world is yet to be born, this is the time of the so-called interregnum. It's a time of morbid phenomena. His interpreters and those who, who interpreted his thesis, they qualified this as ad Interim, the time in between, the time when you are waiting for a new world to appear. What will this new world look like? Now, it's obvious that the old world has brought us to where we are now. And Kissinger himself qualified this as chaos. And the book that I'm talking about is called The World Order. Kissinger says that international order will be transformed into a world order. And so what will this new world order look like in the sphere of economy? This is what we call globalization, and globalization as an economic project is a successful one. It enabled you, it allowed you an access to all kinds of digital services and products produced on this planet. However, in, political, in the political sense of the world, uh, of the word, sorry, the global, uh, globalization failed. Now, what will this order look like, this order that has failed Westphalia? How will the post-Westphalian order look like? This is a major dilemma. If we know that states are slowly losing their sovereignty due to the fact of globalization, or in other words, that they do not control all of the processes that were happening and began before globalization, then uh, the role of the state is brought into question. A Slovenian philosopher, Žižek, leftist, also you must know Slavoj Žižek, uh, he said that there will be a time, th there, there is a time when capitalism divorced democracy. And this is why he supported the Crouch thesis this, that we are now in the, in the time of post-democracy because, and this was a, a taboo back in the day, nobody wanted to, uh, to criticize democracy in, because they would have been labeled as anti-democratic. But now this is the dilemma of the 20th century. Other philosophers will say that the essence is in the fact that the politics is losing its power. So we have a divorce not only uh, between capitalism and democracy, but also politics and power. Because you don't have power in politics anymore. Power is slowly shifting in um, the corporations and the new actors of the 21st century. What can we learn from this and can we anticipate or foresee what will happen in the near future? If the, the fundamental categories such as state, democracy, capitalism are now in their post phase. The lesson is that each and every time we need to find the beginnings of a certain state and look for the solutions there. So in order to understand post-Westphalia, we need to see what pre-Westphalia looked like. Westphalia promoted the model of Boden on sovereignty. Westphalia promoted the um, model of uh, secularism. It promoted what we now know as nation-states. But what 
what was happening before that, before was Falia. Because of the influence of the last two centuries, this seems like a closed chapter, but still there are manuscripts that describe the functioning of the world before Westphalia. An extraordinary and forgotten uh, author is Johannes Althusius. It's a Dutch professor, a theologist, who wrote a brilliant book named Politica Methodica Digesta. It's a book that was published during the uh, Sp uh, war between Spain and the Netherlands and when Althusius was a secretary in a northern uh, town of Enden, perhaps it's now in a different territory, but never mind. So all the those from uh, persecuted from England, they used to stay in that particular town and they brought two books with them. When they went to the New World later on, it was the Bible and the Politica Digesta. So if you read the founding fathers of uh, the states, you will find many terms used by Althusius. He envisages a different world from Boden. Boden looks for a vertical power and sovereignty around which there will be the people. So uh, he, he looked for a centralized system. Althusius, on the other hand, says that the a state can function and be constituted without a vertical power, that it can perfectly be horizontal, so the people can be united where they live and in accordance with, with their interests they will, um, they will constitute their own communities. He envisages a state as a community of communities. They are, they were uh, people back then, according to his concept, uh, were grouped in different interest groups, and they all have. Uh, had a representative at the level of the state. So, with this horizontal system, everybody belonged to a certain community, whether it was professional or uh, some other kind. Something that today we can compare to the Facebook groups. These are communities that are shaped and reshaped uh, every day. These are people of, uh, these are groups of people who think alike. What is Amazon? Uh, a guild of, uh, um, a group of traders, what are Alibaba or AliExpress? These are groups of people who trade. What is the internet at the end of the day? It's the community of all digital communities. So nowadays, with the digital transformation of the world, if you read Althusius through this new prism, you will see that the world is possible, it's possible to function in a very different way without conflicts uh, about a territory or sovereign rights. This is one dimension. The second dimension in this digitalized world brought to something else. It brought to major, tra uh, to major uh, migrations because Demographics is changing. Africa in just a few decades will have 2 billion people. All of the young people in the United States are using the advantages of the digital era. They all own um, a, a smartphone. They, uh, and people, young people everywhere, they want to be in Europe. Why? Because Europe remained uh, a lifestyle superpower. So these young people, they arrive here. Uh, Africans, for example, but are unfortunately rejected. But on the other hand, they know how to show solidarity among themselves. You need to read with digital eyes Ibn Khaldun, an Arab philosopher, who says that although the Arabic um, civilization is a nomadic one, they always carry something with themselves. It's something that is called the concept of asabiya. It's the connecting tissue, it's the loyalty towards a tribe. So although you change your territory, you change the place of residence, you remain loyal to your original community. So you want, you would want to see that and you would, in that way you will understand why we have this relationship with the Arabic world. You should read that with a digital uh, prism, a digital digital eyes, as I call it. You should read Ibn Khaldun, definitely. Now, because of this major inflow of migrants from the Middle East, you have many Muslims coming to Europe, and Europe has somehow always had a negative view, and uh, even Islamophobia towards that world. But Macedonia has had an experience of six centuries with Islam, and we've never had problem. Same goes for the 
other uh, nearby countries. Why is that? Because why, while Catholics and Protestants were killing each other in Europe, the Sultan who occupied the Balkan territories established the so-called system of religious autonomy called the millet system because but the only people with a book with a holy book had the rights so christians jews and muslims they had every right in the ottoman empire they had the right to their own leader the so-called millet bashi in turkish language then the patriarch representing all christians and the high rabbi uh, representing all Jews. So everybody had the uh, religious freedom, they had the right to learn, to, to study in their own language, they had their own canonic laws that they respected and they had everything but territory. So the millet is a non-territorial community. This is why when you hear the word Rumelia, it means Rumillet, because all Christians in the Ottoman Empire, they were called the so-called Rumi and their, uh, their community was called the Rum Millet. This brought to, to the fact of, of the Caucasus, the Balkans and the Middle East being uh, in peace for several centuries. So when you read human history, you will see that the entire history with written history, with facts and arguments, is uh, 3,000 years old. Before that, it was all myths and legends. But out of these 3,000 years, we've had 2,700 years of conflicts and wars in the planet. And um, the period of peace was for 300 years. Most of that, those peaceful periods, happened in the Balkans, in the Middle East, and in the Caucasus. Part of that uh, period was called Pax Romana and the Pax Ottomana. So imagine in the 15th century with the religious wars happening in Europe, how was it then possible for all other religions to live in peace in the Middle East and in the Balkans? Well, because they had the right to practice their religion, their tradition and their culture. And they also had open space. Although the Roman Empire was a tyranny, the Ottoman Empire was a despot. People had no borders, there were no frontiers, and people were free to use that entire space. By belonging to one millet, you actually belong to that entire territory, simply because millet is not related to territory. You are free to um, study and to, to, um, to work on the territory of the entire empire. After the French Revolution and their ideas, the ideas of nation, nation and sovereignty came to the Balkans, then the conflicts started, the conflicts that uh, last even today because an open space creates people with open mind, and people with open minds need competition, they need to prove their uh, capabilities, they create markets of ideas, of services, and they reach a higher level, they create uh, a lingua franca, a communication code, and they believe in a neutral power. Before, it used to be either the Roman Emperor or the Sultan in the Ottoman Empire, but in today's terms, all of these communities are again unterritorial. Internet is providing you a possibility to have that open space. Again, you have the opportunity to communicate among each other without the mediation of a state. So this is one more experience that we can draw from the empires, something that is again related to the post-Westphalian period. What else can we learn? Something that can be useful are the, 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 the teachings that come from the East towards the West. The first contact of the East and the West happened when Alexander the Great, Alexander the Macedonian, uh, conquered Persia and reached India. He was the first leader to bring philosophers and scientists with him in order for them to study and to research about the life in the territories that he conquered. When they reached um, India, one of the philosophers called Piron wanted to see what the local locals lived like and he met 
a community that claim that they are the happiest community in the entire world. Then he met, uh, he, he met another community that believed that they were the most successful and so on and so forth. And Piron was, had difficulty to believe them. According to, to his notes, the Buddhists taught him to not believe any of, of those communities, anyone. So this is the, his philosophy. Something that that moved from the east to the west. He did not leave any manuscripts, but his thoughts were conveyed by his students. He even countered the biggest wisdom of the ancient world. You know, when Socrates saw the um, went to Delphi, and when she when the prophet there told him that he was the smartest, then Piron, he, he opposed this, this uh, even the most famous thought of Socrates. Today, this philosophy is called skepticism, and this is the basis for every scientific discipline. If you don't have any doubts, then you will never be able to find the truth or the right, reliable result of, from your research. This also influenced some of the philosophers. One of the most important philosophers who were influenced by this philosophy is Epicurus. When the polis lost its power, when the cosmopolis um, rose, then we, we come to what Gramsci defined as interregnum. What does Epicur Epicurus said? He said, enjoy life. Um, and find your happiness and uh, start that pursuit of happiness. And this is where we come to the American Declaration of Independence and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, part of the founding fathers were Epicureans. He is the one who also um, promoted hedonism. His philosophy was that life is too short to spend it doing something that you don't want to do. However, his hedonism is to indulge in, min in the minimum. Then the Epicureans will uh, be opposed by another philosopher called Zenon. Zenon says that not everything is uh, about enjoyment and indulgence. He says that nothing in life lasts forever, that everything will eventually pass, and that you need to be patient and you need to to pay attention to what is within you. He finds all the answers within oneself. So by discovering what is within you, you will discover what is the, the substance of the world. This is what he defined as the logos. Logos is the basis for everything. Logos, when you understand the concept of logos, you will understand the functioning of the, of the world because the word logos means word. With that, you change things, you change concepts if you don't know how to describe a concept, then the concept simply does not exist. So his philosophy is that you need to be patient, patient. And that is the basis for Stoicism. The last great Stoic is the last uh, the last uh, philosopher. It's Marcus Aurelius. If you have seen The Gladiator, at the beginning of the film, you will see the uh, uh, you will see Marcus Aurelius. He wrote notes about his life. And uh, these are the so-called meditations. Meditations is one of the most popular books in the East. If you go to China, you will see that it's a best-selling book. Why is that? Because you need to understand that life is a fight, it's a struggle, and that you need to to uh, persist and that everything will eventually pass. After Christianity came on the scene, Logos will get a human personification. It's Jesus Christ. And this is how it continues to exist until today. In this new era, where do we find these teachings, these schools? You will see, you will find skeptics in the universities and in the post-modernist movement. Where are the Epicureans? You will find them as the modern day consumers. What they see on TV and on the internet, they want to have it at home the next day. They order the newest iPhone, they order the newest Tesla, and so on. They, they 
always order something because they enjoy this consumerism. Stoics, you will find them in those who are trying to go through this time and who try to persuade us that this too will pass. We see, with having all of this in mind, that this time is not something that is a precedent in human history. Uh, nothing lasts forever and everything is cyclical. The teachings of philosophers and philosophers themselves, they always try to find an answer, to anticipate what will happen. One of the controversial philosophers from the beginning of the 20th century who opposed the Oxford Union because it was too liberal for his taste was Spengler. Spengler was always writing negative uh, comments about your activities, the activities of this institution, but Spengler happened in a time when there was a feeling that something was about to happen, and so he wrote uh, a book called The Sunset of the West. It's a brilliant book that will that was published in 1918, so 99 years ago. In this book, Spengler said that all human civilizations have their beginning, their development and peak, and their end. And by describing all of the ancient civilizations, he said that they are like plants. They grow, they develop, they mature, and in the end they fade out. They fade away. And I, my feeling is that he said that this, the same thing will happen with the West. What he wrote about actually happened during the uh, First World War. Part of what he wrote also happened during the Second World War. But I'm mentioning Spengler because he left us with uh, an, apparatu an apparatus that enables us to interpret developments and processes even today. It's his concept of pseudomorphosis. Pseudomorphosis is a term that he borrowed from the science of minerals. In, min in mineralogy, uh, it's said that minerals grow even, uh, through, even for a thousand years and they expand and create a certain form. But by achieving this um, form, they lose their content. The, a new mineral then enters the shape of the old mineral. So this is the so-called pseudomorphosis. This creates a lot of problems for mineralogists because you see one thing happening on the outside and an entirely different story happening on the inside of the mineral. With this approach, Spengler tried to explain what was happening in the West with the collapse of Rome, the collapse of Rome, for example. Rome created their own territory, but they failed to adapt to the new time. This form of Rome was then, create, uh, was then used by Christianity. They entered this form and they expanded to the borders of the Roman Empire. When Christianity expanded the borders of the former Roman Empire, they created the Western civilization. Western civilization is, in a way, that mineral that entered the form previously created by Christianity. So here we arrive to the fact that the West as a civilization is perhaps in, in the phase of major transformation. This also leads to a feeling of pessimism in all of those who are able to see this process of pseudomorphosis actually happening. But if you know the previous influences from the East and the previous philosophies coming from the East to the West, and if you have in mind natural sciences, you will see that apart from pseudomorphosis, we know something that is also called metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is what happens in nature. It's, it's complicated to explain, but I will use a metaphor. When you're rock, walking uh, around the woods, you, you see caterpillars eating leaves. And your perception might be that one day there will be so many caterpillars that, that, that they will destroy every single leaf in the woods. But if you have the necessary knowledge, and if you are informed, you will know that caterpillars at a certain point in time will become a cocoon and 
Then later on, at a given point in time, they will transform into a butterfly. Nobody looks at a butterfly negatively. And what is the, the point of all this? It's that if you're a pessimist, while you're walking around and, and looking at the world around you, the only thing you will see is caterpillars. In other words, only terrorists, jihadists and extremists. From that point of view, the world is truly a dangerous place to live today. But if you know that this world is in the process of transforming itself into a new world, a new shape, you will know that at a certain point in time, the time of butterflies will arrive. So my recommendation is for you to open your eyes for those butterflies and not for the caterpillars only. Because there is this old wisdom from the East saying that when the wind blows, you have some people building walls, but other people building windmills. Be the people, be the generation that will be build windmills and produce something beneficial, produce something new. Open your mind and look at the state of things in their dynamics as ha they happen in that process of metamorphosis, because you belong to the millennial generation, you are the, the Y generation, our generation was the X generation, before us we had the baby boom generation, and before that it was a glorious generation after the World War II. Before them there was this lost generation after World War I. You were born in the 20th century, but you will realize yourselves in the 21st century. After you, you will be followed by the Z generation. What, what are the main features of the millennials of your generation? You are the first truly digital generation. We are perhaps the last analog generation, if we talk in terms of, of our generation. The digital generation, generation, the millennials, they are much more interested in talking about nanomaterials, 3D printers, they want to talk about uh, startups, they want to discuss uh, artificial intelligence, they want to read Homo Deus, they want to read literature that is opening perspectives about this new world that is yet to be born. However, the following generation the following generation will probably know how to use an iPod before they start talking. Uh, and we see that happening. They, they, you have little kids uh, perfectly using the newest gadgets. So the Z generation, according to the alphabet, should be the last one. But no, it will probably be followed by the alpha generation. That generation will enjoy all of the benefits of today. You know that yesterday or the day before the first robot actually obtained citizenship. You know that there are many countries providing digitalized digital citizenships. You know that there is a digital transformation of the world and this digital transformation created a world in which everything is at the tip of your hand, everything is very close to you. You have uh, all the benefits of this uh, civilization in your pockets. You can even Google whatever I am talking about as I am speaking. This proves that interaction will be a, a style of life. Your life will be filled with many information, a lot of information, but no free time. And when you don't have free time, you don't have the time to to think, to reflect, to contemplate. And when you don't have the time to think, then you won't have the time to deal with ethics, with reasoning, with making the right choice. And here is the, the, that, that possibility of failing. So always have free time for yourselves. Um, leave some time to di digest all of that knowledge that you have and to understand, to grasp the essence of those irreversible and unstoppable processes. Many things that we are judging today are processes and things that we will be glorifying tomorrow. So always keep an open mind and be creative and be innovative. Don't spend your time dealing with people who are always complaining and saying and talking about their failures and their frustrations. Don't waste your time on, on such people because they, uh, everyone is responsible for whatever is happening to them. But dedicate your time to people who will, in a conversation of 15 minutes, at least mention the, the word creativity or new ideas at least two or three times. So people who talk about a new world, a new lifestyle, that new world is 
is being born, but we have to open our eyes and see it. The butterflies are, are around us, but we are we we always look at the caterpillars. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I think that this was enough as food for thought, and maybe uh, for questions if you have. Thank you so much for uh, those inspiring words. We'll open up now to the audience for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand nice and high and wait for the microphone to come to you. I ask you to ask your questions in English so that everybody uh, can understand. Um, let's start with you and the red jumper with, on the edge. That. Well, thank you for this uh, inspiring talk. Um, I was wondering, um, you talked about open borders and a new world. Where would you see uh, your job as a president of a sovereign nation of today's world in the near future? What will countries look like? What will international diplomacy look like in this new world that you would describe right now? We are still living in a world related to territory and to nation states, and states will will be here for a, a long while. But I'm talking about this new your world, your new world that is that is uh, slowly appearing. So the world as we know it will remain the same. The United Nations are the only representative of all the countries in the world. But we need to give much more credit to the United Nations. We need to open the debate at the planetary, at the global level. We are going at the General Assembly and everybody is uh, saying what they want to say. We are not having a, a true debate. We don't have a debate about the issues that are concerning for the entire planet for the first time. In history, the entire humanity is on the same boat, although we are in separate cabins. But in the past, in the 20th century, every country had their own boat, and they were sailing their own separate boats. But now we're all on the same boat. But who is the captain of that boat? Obviously, as politicians and statesmen, we, we don't have much influence to the course that that boat will take. But you, as a generation in a world that is emerging, in which no, countries will, of course, stay, but uh, um, the decision makers will be uh, located in the uh, factories of thought in this new world that is now in a very risky situation from the point of view of environment protection, conflicts, then the rise of, the, the, of criminality, because everything is digitalized and even criminality. Uh, take a look at whatever there is on the deep web. However, on one hand, this also allows you to have access through torrents to all of the products of human civilization, all of this for free, so books, movies, music, everything that has ever been created or produced. This is what Mason qualified as post-capitalism. Capitalism, um, capitalism produced its own killer. Now there is no profits. Everybody is, is, is uh, 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 there is a tendency for the price of everything to be zero, to be free. And this is the main advantage for your generation. States no longer control the transfers of knowledge, of digital services, of whatever is happening in the meantime. And this is why myself, as, as a former professor and now president of my country, I'm trying to apply all of the new ideas, both at the regional level and at the European level. And whenever I have the opportunity to say this in the United Nations, I always speak about the challenges of our generation and the responsibility that we have towards you and the world that we should leave you. And this is why everyone should contribute to make this life better. For the first time in Western civilization, children of today are living in worse conditions than their parents. So your predecessors, they don't have work, they're unemployed, they don't have their own families, they don't have a perspective to succeed in life. But for the first time, and in one place, there, there are actually young people living better than their parents. What is that place? It's China.
In China, today's generations live better than their parents. Why? Because they understood that they too should change. They adapted, uh, they adopted a philosophy that was created in Singapore. If you remember, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, he, he actually revealed the secret of their success. Singapore was a, a, a meaningless port that is now the world financial center. It's the richest country in the world and an example to all other countries. So when that prime minister was asked about the formula of his success, he said three things were important. <coughs> Meritocracy, pragmatism, pragmatism and honesty. You want to create your own family, a company, or even manage a state, a country. Just gather around you the successful people, so meritocracy. The successful people are the ones who bring success. You want to find a solution, learn from others' experiences, don't just push away problems, just deal with them, resolve them, and third, Honesty, zero corruption, zero criminality. If you have corruption or crime, then nothing will happen, even if you have the previous two. And this is something that China has adopted, meritocracy, pragmatism, and honesty. Same goes for you and for all other people in the planet. If we manage to succeed in this, then we will all be successful. Are you satisfied with, with the response? Okay, next question. Um, yeah, let's let's come to you at the front. Just wait for the microphone to come. Uh, so uh, I was particularly intrigued by the notion that you began with referring to wars between different uh, Christian denominations in in the uh, Middle Ages and the late and, and the early modernity. Uh, I was wondering if we were able to like properly transfer the ideas and the notions that you talked about there with regard to uh, religious conflicts today because the impression that we usually gain from conflicts with islam uh, or islamist ext extremism is that usually um there is no reciprocity in whatever happens in these conflicts and especially as also your country has a very severely experienced in 2015 with refugee refugee um movements would you really argue that um a globalized society can be understood in any ways as a homogenous whole, or would you not rather agree that still uh, ethnic tensions exist, ethnic boundaries exist, and that, that um, perhaps the nation state is probably the more long-lasting alternative that should be favored over a, a unique, homogenized, uh, globalized society? You know how the war between Catholics and Protestants actually began when Protestants in a castle in today's Czech Republic threw from uh, the window of that castle three Catholic priests. This is how um, how it all began. Why? Because there was intolerance. They treated each other as enemies. And one controversial German philosopher said, no, they treated themselves as foes, as, as uh, real enemies. The word, the word foe is an archaic word that you can, you can find in Shakespeare, uh, in Shakespeare in English. This is what happened with the philosophy, with the promotion of the philosophy of tolerance. The West relies on the concept of tolerance. And what does tolerance mean? It means I don't like you, but I can stand your presence. I can tolerate you. But we were raised in a different spirit, us living in the Balkans, in the Middle East, and even in the East in general. We never, we never truly uh, 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 had secularism, whereby religion is a private, intimate thing. In our case, we always had the philosophy of respect. So I don't want you to tolerate me. I want you to respect me. Respect me 
in who I am in order for you to have my respect in return. And this is why for six centuries we have respected Muslims because we've always had their respect. And this is why there is no Islamophobia in our uh, part of the world. Uh, there were one million migrants transiting Macedonia in 2015 and we helped those people as much as we could. But when the migration wave was then started, uh, uh, was then abused by terrorists and extremists, so to be used by people who came to Europe and com uh, and committed the, the terrorist attacks in Paris, we closed the border and we said the right to asylum will be given to refugees and not to economic migrants. Refugees are the ones who run away, unfortunately, from their homes. They, they are homeless. And who wants to run away from home. So those are people who need help. They lost their homes, they lost their belongings, they lost their families, and they have the right to asylum. They need to be helped. They should be treated with solidarity. They don't want us to tolerate them. They want us to respect them. And this is why we have frustrations. This is why those people have difficulties integrating in European societies, because what they expect is respect. What will that world look like? This world is composed of many worlds, and these worlds and these negative perceptions that we spoke about, and extremists and terrorists, they will continue to exist. They've always existed, and they will be here for a while. But Eastern philosophy says that you cannot I believe that you can actually destroy all evil. The essence is to maintain a balance, because if even if you destroy all evil, there is always a grain of evil in everything good, just like the other way around. This is the yin-yang uh, concept. So there should always be a balance between the two. It's a wrong perception that you can eradicate evil. This is the philosophy from that Catholic Protestant war, uh, because as I said Catholics saw Protestants as foes and people who should as people who should be eliminated. This is why those uh, wars were merciless and ruthless. But if you if you understand that other people can have other opinions, that they can have other perceptions and understandings about life, you can either tolerate them or respect them. But we always prefer to be respected. The basis of reconciliation is respect. And this is the obligation, the responsibility of your generation, because you are, are a generation that lives globally. You contact with other civilizations and cultures and religions every day. You must understand that other people do not want to be tolerated, they want to be respected. Whether there will be ethnic conflicts or tensions, yes, of course, as they have uh, they, they've always existed. But they should be limited in a way, restricted, because you see, our region, from our region, there are almost 1,000 foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq. 60% of them came back. From Europe, there are around 60,000, and they are all coming back. They went there as extremists, but they are coming back as terrorists. We were convinced that those people could be de-radicalized, but no. We saw that those people cannot be de-radicalized, they should be isolated, because if you send them to, to prison, then they will transform the prison in their university of terrorism, they will indoctrinate other prisoners. But this is a responsibility of all states and countries towards those who are not tolerant, those who are extremists, those who are, those who are extreme in any way or use violence, those who do not respect others, they should be isolated and they should be treated differently. In future, there will also be people who are not positive, people who are destructive in their actions, but good people should always find a way to organize themselves and not not uh, uh, concede, because the Almighty, whether we call him uh, God or Jehovah or Allah or uh, universe, whatever you want to call it, he created us all equal, but half of us good and half of us bad or evil. Our parents lived in a world with two billion bad and two billion good people, roughly uh, said, but today there are 7.5 billion people on the planet, so out of those 7.5 
billion, so half of them are good and half of them are bad, or malintentioned. But those who are good people, they should never allow and they should never step back when they see bad people because good will never fight good. But if you leave evil to fight evil, then, then it will neutralize itself. You should just leave them be. This is the philosophy of survival. It's the philosophy of the Stoics. You need to persist. You need to overcome. Nothing is ideal. Uh, and as much as we want to to see everything being ideal, uh, the the bigger the deception will, uh, the bigger the disappointment. Sorry, will be, because you should understand something. Whoever has nothing good to say about themselves, they will speak bad about others as well. Your thoughts define your actions. Your thoughts define your words. Your thoughts, if they are not well-intentioned, can bring you into conflict, can push you into conflict with people. And one more message that contains the history of humanity, it's an East, uh, Eastern um, wisdom. It's love what you have, in the sense of loving and respecting and keeping and preserving what you already have. If you want what you don't have, you will lose what you already have. But if you love and you respect and preserve what you have, one day you will have even what you don't have now. So, love your colleagues, love your professors, take care of your families, love your streets, your town, love your country, and love the human civilization. Everything is in. Everything goes back to love, and this is why my advice is to respect what you have, and you have freedom, you have prosperity, you have opportunities at this beautiful university to go upwards where there is no limit, and you should compete in who will go higher. Just don't do like the older generations, expanding, just expanding to more territory and so on. No, go forward with your mind, with your perceptions, go upwards. The sky is always an inspiration. It's blue. It represents freedom. My recommendation is to fill your life with, with that freedom, to enjoy that freedom and happiness and prosperity, and that will breed success. Then we have time for one more. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's go to you in the red and white. Yeah, you. Yeah. Microphone. So thank you for your wise words. You spoke of the connectivity in the African nation states, and then you talked of Asabaya in the Balkan states and the Ottoman Empire. Regarding that kind of connectivity where it sounds like, as I understood it, you're talking about the love between a human and a human. As a student who studied in the US, that's a bit hard to see right now with all the racial tensions. What do you think the West or the US specifically can learn from nations like yours? I said that the world is a place where you see the opposition between the forces of good and evil. It's everywhere. So if you don't, if you don't oppose that immediately, then it might become too late. So whatever you see negative, it should be condemned from the very beginning. You should gather people thinking equally as the same and then start ex uh, expanding, the start um, start promoting the, the exact opposite. So freedom does not mean promoting hatred. Freedom does not mean promoting injustice. So everybody who, ex who promotes hate or intolerance or everybody who uh, acts in a negative way towards it, uh, the others should be prevented. And this is what states are for. This is why people gave up many things and that tra they transferred those rights to the state because they expect the state to to stop those negative processes and ideas. And Asabia is what 
kept for centuries what kept a certain community together. It's solidarity. It's uh, something that uh, is there even they are, if, even if those communities were nomadic. You are the modern uh, nomads. You are always in constant movement and you always want to be surrounded by people that you can learn from or at least people who will make you happy. This is the digital asabiya that I uh, spoke about. You will find groups on Facebook, people who think alike and followers of one in the same um, uh, premise or cause. So have in mind, Jesus Christ had only 12 followers and what did he do with the world? Now imagine every one of you having 12 followers, people who will spread good ideas, positive creative ideas. Imagine what kind of a world you can um, create. Just ignore those who try to promote negative ideas and thoughts and hatred. People People who hate are people who have failed. Do you know who the most vocal critics of art are? Those who are failed artists or who, who criticizes uh, successful sports people, those who have failed in sports or in music and so on and so forth. So, thank you. Um, that's all we have time for, I'm afraid. So please join me in thanking President Ivanov. Thank you.